Welcome to the second half of chapter two. In this week of content, we are going to see a shift to far more example videos and fewer lecture videos. However, these lecture videos are extremely important for setting the understanding, the concepts behind what we are applying to these example problems, example situations. Some students feel that they can kind of get that content by reading through the lecture slides, but if you don't watch the videos, you'll miss all of the times when I let us know exactly where common sticking points are. Um, we're never ever trying to hide anything up our sleeves, and my goal is to help us avoid pitfalls when we approach those example videos and then assignments. Okay, so let's get started. At this point in the chapter, from the first half of chapter two, we introduced the ideas of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. In that first half, we focused on the concepts, which are extremely important to understand, and how to study these ideas graphically. What we're gonna focus on now is applying these concepts to numerical problem solving, quantitative problem solving. So these are the two big equations that we came away with so far. And our book has them in this kind of lightish yellow color. Instead of having the subscripts fully written out, we use the subscript of F for final and zero or O for initial. As we get into our, our larger quantitative problems, our story problems, a lot of students call them, although it's just describing a situation that we're trying to figure out, we will be defaulting to use a starting time of zero minutes. It's kind of like we approach a situation with a stopwatch and we start the timer. And so what that allows us to do is to set our initial time to zero and just have T be our stand in for elapsed time. It doesn't seem like that big a difference, and if we compare the top um, to the bottom for each of these, we recognize that we haven't drastically changed how these equations work. When we do constant acceleration problems in this entire section, what we will also be focusing on is paying attention to our units and our sign, things that we've been thinking about in those early um, ideas for chapter one and chapter two A, but what we will also do to simplify things is by forcing ourselves to only look at situations where the acceleration is constant, we can ignore the idea of an average acceleration, the little hat or bar over the A. So that allows us to have a simplified, a more simplified picture of what's going on. We also lose the final subscript, and so we end up with something that still functions the same way as the original definition of average acceleration, but it's just a little bit simpler to write out. It's like giving someone a nickname. Now, if we wanted to rewrite this to be solved for V instead of A, we could do that. And there will be a PDF that goes through all of the derivations and we'll post that on Blackboard. It is useful to see where our new equations come from in the same way that if you are um, going to try a new meal somewhere, you want to know what ingredients go into it. If we do a small amount of algebra rearranging, kind of like stirring the pot, what we can do is get the final velocity v on its own on one side, and then we have an equation that is the same idea as the previous slide, but now we're going to give it a special name. We're going to call it the velocity time equation. It's one of our big three for this part of the chapter. So let's see what we can do with this velocity time equation now. So here's our first example. A bicycle is traveling at five meters per second when it starts down a steep hill. It accelerates at a rate of three meters per second squared for four seconds down the hill. Find the speed of the bike after four seconds. I would like you to try this problem on your own. There are some steps here to help us think through how this problem solving um, should go, and we are going to reiterate and really focus on those steps when we get to the example videos too. 
So the first step is to consider the situation. Drawing a quick picture, especially showing arrows for where velocity is pointing, where acceleration is pointing, is going to be really useful for us. Step two is figuring out, okay, for each piece of information given to me in the problem, what is that piece of information? What can I label it as? The third step is figuring out, okay, what is this problem asking us for? It wants us to report one final number value, a variable, and we want to figure out which, what that is. And then it's only after all of that setup work that we actually start to look for an equation. One of the most common things we as physics professors hear is students say they don't know what equation to use. Really, that only happens if we haven't been practicing the setup at the level that we really want to, want to be seeing. So we're going to see that setup very clearly in separate example videos. For this one, I'm just going to um, go through the steps two through four on the slide. But pause the video and see if you can solve this one on your own. OK. So when we go through this problem, we have a bicycle. And the very first thing we learn about it is that when we started looking at it, it was moving at 5 meters per second. That is our initial velocity. The acceleration, the fact that it's speeding up, means they'll have the same sign as each other. And so we'll give that a positive 3 meters per second squared. And the elapsed time is 4 seconds. By making ourselves a little list with labels, that helps us understand where to put all of these different numbers. It is never ever meant to be a guessing game. Each of these things, both in words and specifically in the units attached to the numbers, are telling us what they are and therefore where they go in equations. So we plug them in, we solve, and we get 17 meters per second. OK, so that was our first smaller problem. A second one for us. Now I want you to try that same problem solving, especially if you didn't that first time through. And really draw out that picture with the arrows for this one, because it will save you from making a common mistake. OK, hopefully you've paused. Now the very first thing we learn about this car is that it's moving at 25 meters per second. That is our starting velocity, our initial velocity. The fact that we're told that it slows down means that the number value of 3 meters per second squared must be negative. That will come from drawing a picture and recognizing that the velocity arrow and the acceleration arrow point in opposite directions. Opposite directions means opposite signs. That is going to be true for the entire semester. And if you get that mantra into your head early, it's really going to help save you from making common mistakes. Opposite directions means opposite signs. We're trying to find the time until the car stops. So we're finding t when the car is no longer moving or its final velocity is 0. So I've written out the pieces of information we were given. The word stops was a piece of information that we wanted to write down. And then we plug those numbers in, and now there's a little bit of algebra to do to solve for t by itself. But we get 8.33 seconds. We will see much more involved and careful problem solving technique in the example videos, which allow us to really see every single step of what we should be setting up. All right. So by the end of this whole section, we are going to have an entire toolkit of useful equations. We never have to memorize equations in this class, but we do need to recognize when to use them. Normally in class, we show derivations on the board. We show where these equations come from. But for this online format, we're going to provide a PDF with explanation um, instead. The key part that we really want to convey is that we already know and have worked with all of the ingredients that go into building what looks like scarier equations. Everything's provided on a test, but the key part is recognizing how these equations can be used. So the next thing we want to add involves the idea of average velocity when we have constant acceleration. 
We saw some VT graphs, velocity time graphs, in the first half of chapter two. The slope is our acceleration, and if we wanted to know the average velocity from some starting point to some ending point, we basically want to know our velocity halfway along that straight line. The average of two numbers when they are kind of equally spaced like this is going to be adding them together and dividing by two. So that's an ingredient that we haven't actually been using quite yet, but we've probably had averages, used averages either in lab this semester or in classes previously. Now, let's see how to use this new ingredient. Suppose a car speeds up from 10 meters per second to 40 meters per second in a time of eight seconds. What is the average velocity during that time? So built in here is the idea that it is speeding up at a constant acceleration because at the very top of the slide, it's motion equations for constant acceleration. And so what that means is we can use our new ingredient. 10 plus 40 is 50 divided by two is 25 meters per second. We haven't used that eight seconds yet, but now if we look at that second question, how far did the car travel during the eight seconds? That allows us to actually use our previous understanding of average velocity from the first half of chapter two. If we are moving at 25 meters per second for eight seconds, we will travel 200 meters. Okay. So the pieces that go into our second big equation, and as a reminder, we're going to show you how these pieces work together to build the new equation in a posted PDF on our Blackboard site. But the ingredients that we're going to be using is, uh, we start with our average velocity equation from before this class, the first half of chapter two, the definition of an average value when there's constant change, so the new ingredient that I um, just presented, and the velocity time equation that we built a couple of slides ago and gave a fancy name to. When we put those all together, it's kind of like watching a cooking show and they've got all of their ingredients laid out in beautiful glass bowls and you're like, my kitchen will never look that good. When we put all these ingredients together, we end up with the position time equation. Now again, this is not coming out of nowhere, and normally we show the full derivation on the chalkboard. We are going to post that as a PDF instead. So we end up with our second really important named equation, which is the position time equation. It is useful if we are trying to find a given position at a known time. It is useful if we are trying to find a position at a known time, or if we are trying to find a time at a known position. That's kind of in the name, it tells us what it does. And then our ingredients for our last big equation is we start out with the definition of constant acceleration that we simplified at the beginning of this lecture video. We add in our average velocity equation from the first half of um, chapter two. And we use this newer ingredient of average um, velocity when we have constant acceleration. And again, just like before, we mix all these up. We bake this beautiful cake. We will show you how that works in a posted PDF. And what we end up with is the velocity position equation, sometimes known as the no time equation. If you have the velocity and you want position, we use this. If we have the position and we want velocity, we use this. A quick shortcut is if we're not given any information about time in the problem and we know we aren't trying to solve for it, we use the no time equation. So these are the five equations that we now have access to when we are solving problems in this portion of the chapter. We've got the equations on one side, we've got a description of them on the other side, and it's really important to recognize something here. These equations can only be used when the assumptions that we've made are true. So these only work if we are solving problems where the acceleration is constant. For us in Physics 125, that's always going to be true, but I just want us to understand the limitations of these. For this particular set of equations, the motion has to be in a single dimension. 
In chapter three, we introduce how these get adjusted when we are moving in two dimensions. And we assumed that we are starting our timer at zero so that t is whatever later time it is in the problem. We will primarily use the three named equations at the bottom in the same way that if you go to your um, toolbox, there's those weird like Allen wrenches, you don't remember what project they were for, but your hammer, your screwdriver, the big important commonly used tools, you know their name and you know what they're there for. It's the same idea here. So our problem solving process that I will be showing us how it works for every single example we encounter is the same every time. If you go through the problem solving process and actually label each step as you go, you will train yourself to be able to handle any situation, whether it is a simple situation or a more difficult one. Nearly every single mistake on the homework can be avoided by using this process and not just trying to plug numbers in and hope for the best. So I just wanna show us these examples because these are the ones that each have their own um, example video. So we've mentioned this before, I just wanna um, present them here briefly. We have a car speeding up that we ask questions about. We have a car slowing down that we um, ask questions about. We have a car that slows down and we're trying to find the acceleration. That is often harder than um, some of the other questions we can ask. We have a car speeding up and we're trying to figure out um, how long it takes to travel a certain distance. And we have a box that is finally not a car, right? A box that is slowing down and we're trying to figure out what its initial velocity was. Figuring out initial velocity is also a little bit more difficult than some of the other questions that we can answer. So when you go through all of those lecture videos, they're next in line in the playlist and next um, that will be posted on Blackboard. You'll see the same process work out over and over. And really every single time we're given three of these five quantities and we're solving for one or both of the remaining quantities. It is definitely possible to make these problems harder, but in general, they make the setup more complex without adding to the physics. So I wanna point out how physics textbooks can make these problems more complex, but also I want us to recognize that Physics 125, we, we don't have to do those most complicated problems just because they're more complicated. <laughs> So for example, if we have an acceleration of one number for a while, and then we speed up or slow down for a different um, while, then there's a lot of keeping track of, you have to solve for that middle point, and it's a whole bunch of more complicated, messier mathematics without adding any additional physics understanding. Another common idea is a multi-object problem if two cars are driving at different rates, but accelerating at different speeds, there's a lot to keep track of without actually adding more to our physics understanding. And the single most important thing we can really point out here is that um, for the courses that GRCC offers, in Physics 115, 125, and 245, the physics itself is actually the same. In general, the big differences is what math we have access to and how complex the setup is for problems. For Physics 245, the calculus-based physics, those students might be going into engineering or places where they really do need to know those multi-stage or multi-object problems. For our group, those extra messy math problems, they don't really add value to our specific learning objectives. You might see them in the textbook, but I just want us to recognize that the range of difficulty that we see in example videos, in practice sets, in problem sets, that's the range of difficulty we'll see on the test. We're not gonna automatically, or all of a sudden rather, um, make these way tougher than what we've been seeing. Okay, so to wrap up this lecture video, uh, there's this list from the chapter 2.6 problem solving um, that we've actually already talked about briefly and that you will see happen in every sim single example video that we do. 
It's the problem solving steps and this particular slide might be useful to copy out into your notebook or to print out and have access to and try to train yourself to do these steps in order. Even if the earliest problems in chapter two are making sense, if you cut corners now, you really aren't training yourself to be able to handle the tougher problems that we'll see on assignments and then on tests as well. So I will see you in the next lecture video.